Our person I'd like to acknowledge is Barry Posner. So I stole this quote, you can make a difference and you can't do it alone. Um, they're just two truths for me in terms of my life, the leadership that have been really meaningful for me and I'm going to touch on that near the end of the presentation. Um, so this sort of, we'll spend 30 minutes on this becoming an effective agent for change and getting connected as, as the theme. And then I've also just, uh, um, I'm going to give you six gems that I got from the overall conference in terms of things that were key learnings, learnings for me that I got a lot out of. Um, so look, I just wanted to uh, set a couple of slides to set the scene and I was really taken by this um, slide from Martin Luther King. And I guess, um, I guess most people in this room are involved in change in one way or another. And uh, change is hard, I find change hard. And you know, a lot of it's to do with the barriers and the struggles that come up when we're in the middle of a change process. And I guess if I think about my own career, the times that um, I've been the most stressed out or awake at night have always been around major change events. Uh, and if I think about the time I was working with Pete in a Capital and Coast Hut and Wire Apra, it was when we were trying to bring the three lab services together. And as you can imagine, um, big dollars, lots of politics, lots of change and lots of stress. So do need to acknowledge that, that change is stressful um, and it is hard. Um, Helen Bevan talks uh, a lot about uh, change starting on the fringe and I, and I really like this idea and, and I know we've had a session about healthcare radicals um, and, and I'm sure there's a few radicals in this room um, but often they're the people who name things that others don't see yet and they point to new horizons and without them the storyline never changes. Um, and I think, you know, I certainly recognise I've got those sort of people um, uh, sitting in my team. And, and again, an example, and the person's not here and they'll remain nameless, but um, I think about someone in my team who often comes to me with what I think are these outlandish ideas. Um, and she's done this on, oh, she, I gave it away. I've got she, <laughs> she. She comes to me and puts these ideas on the table and we have a discussion about them. And I think, why on earth would we get involved in that? And on the three occasions she's brought these things to me in the last year, guess what? We're doing all three of them. And I'm happy to talk about them a bit later. But they're things that I thought, you know, I couldn't relate to, but she had the vision, uh, she saw what the potential was, and, and she pursued it with me. Now, why we haven't got technology is I can't show you YouTube at the end, which is a bit disappointing, but anyway. Um, I don't think this is a risk for this district health board um, because I think we've got a history of being innovative, we've adopted the IHI methodology, we've got the service improvement unit, um, we've got uh, Joe's role which is testament to wanting to be innovative. But I do think we're an organisation that has struggled with um, closing the loop and implementing sometimes and I think we do some great work around change management but really just want to emphasise the importance of us finishing our change projects and, and I have to acknowledge in my areas where we, we're good at doing the strategy and the planning but we're not good at, at doing that last bit and that's really, really important. And I think that's where it's great as an organisation we've got the IHI tools to help us to help us with that um, change management process. Um, there's a ton of stuff happening in change and I just want to touch on a few of the examples that were given at the conference um, starting with more disruptive change and obviously in the NHS at the moment um, there's billions of dollars being taken out of the health system, yet they're being asked to do uh, more and more. So it does require uh, things to be done in a different way. And the example that was given um, at the conference, which I thought was really interesting, is there's a lot less two, three, four and five year change programs going on, and a lot more 30, 60, 90 day change programs going on. So the need for that sort of disruptive change, uh, for that tester change, and I think some of the thinking that we, that we put in place through, through IHI is really important. Um, digital connections, um, hands up who's got a social media account. Oh come on Brian, no social, no, no social media account. And how many connections do you have? Just shout out how many connections you've got on Facebook, who knows? 400. Um, 400? Any, any, any takers on 400? So I guess the message here, um, uh, employers have 10 times more connections than corporate social accounts. And if you think about the collective uh, networks that you have in this room, if we were to add up our Facebook connections, we'd probably be in the hundreds. Um, work complexity, I probably don't need to sell you on, on work complexity. I think we're, we're living and breathing that. Um, but one of the um, fantastic examples um, that I saw around how an organisation deals with work complexity was a, a conversation I had <coughs> with the international marketing manager for IKEA. Again, this was at the conference. And he put up this very, um, I thought, fantastic slide, which was people equal potential minus distraction. 
And in IKEA, they've got this real emphasis on helping people to do their job in a more simpler way because the environment's become so complex, and they've got a whole kind of stream of work behind taking away the distraction out of the work environment. And I just, I just really like that. Um, changes from the edge. Um, a traditional R&D is no longer sufficient, so there's more innovation centres in the UK, for example. They've got a UK policy. Uh, they've got UK policy lab, and this is a, 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 a testing ground for experimenting on the fringe. And um, when they do this testing, um, uh, looking at what things can be brought into the mainstream. So the kind of uh, traditional R&D model that goes on forever and a day. Um, is no longer fit for purpose. So the talk, the talking about sparking new ideas, experimenting faster, but also failing faster. And I really like that sort of thought. Um, change in power. Um, I think, um, Suzanne, you put this up a couple of meetings ago, didn't you? Yeah, and I think this is an, an important one again, um, uh, around some of the changes going on with power paradigms. Um, moving from the old power, which is more hierarchical based, pushed down, held by a few and closed, to new power, which is about being current, being made by many, being shared, and being open. Um, and I guess if I think about um, if I think about my role, um, there's no doubt I've got hierarchical power. I can influence things. I can make decisions on things. But if I look at my team, um, I've got members in my team which I say would have more influence over some of the projects that I'm working on um, than I do. So who are those people within your teams that are that are well connected and networked? And I, and I think this is a really interesting slide. People who are highly connected have twice as much power to influence change as people, have, people who have hierarchical power. You might not agree with that. But. So again, recognising Helen Bevan's work, um, the network secrets of great change agents. And this slide starts to speak of the importance of all of our informal uh, networks impacting on change. And informal networks are important, um, are more important than your uh, position in the formal hierarchy. And I think that's um, something that's really um, rung true for me the last couple of years, working with this district health board, coming in new and not having the contacts and needing to build, build my own networks and relationships. And the idea, if we want to create big change, we need to be bridging networks between disconnected groups. Again, thinking about spreading change through strong ties, um, it, interacting with people like us, people with the same life experiences, beliefs and values. And this is often uh, changes that is peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer or GP-to-GP, -GP, or planning and funding to planning and funding, because it's safe and easy and we've got great connections and it's, it's easy to do. And, and the great thing about um, having strong ties is it's wor it works because you're far more likely to be influenced to adopt new ways of working with those you're most strongly tied to. So and I, I guess you'll all, have your own, you'll all have your own strong tie networks that you work in every day. And I, I think the other point to make is we do tend to revert to strong ties in, in, in times of uncertainty because it's safe and it's easy. Um, and the next slide I just wanted to touch on is spreading change through weak ties. Um, and um, the view from sort of uh, the conversation I had with Helen was um, weak ties are more likely to lead to change at scale and we can access people with fewer barriers. And when we seek to spread change through weak ties, we build bridges, create late relationships on common purpose and mobilise all the assets in our organisation to achieve our, our goals. And I want to give you a really, uh, I think it's a good example, but I also think it's a funny one. And have you guys heard of crowdsourcing? Yeah, so crowdsourcing, so I hadn't actually heard of it until I went to the conference in April, but um, so I was a little bit behind the times. So outsourcing is when you task to a crowd or a group uh, for a common goal, and it's often um, uh, powered by new technology. So it's a great way of doing this kind of um, weak tie uh, spread. And in, the, um, in England, they, have, they had this crowdsourcing activity where they wanted to name a new boat. Um, and it was uh, uh, the pride and joy of the English um, research and development um, fleet, 200 million pound boat. So they went to crowdsourcing and they got a whole lot of names in, the Endeavour, the Henry Worsley, Falcon, David Edinburgh, and the leading uh, vote was the RSS Boaty McBoatface. <laughs> <laughs> so careful what you wish for with crowdsourcing. Six gems from Gothenburg. So, these were really just things that I took home that meant something to me. Um, so I just thought I'd share those with you. There's a whole mix in here. Um, but I, this um, statement to me is about leadership and action and, and just thinking about our role as healthcare leaders and how important it is to um, realise what you, what you do and how you behave really matters. So look at your shadow. The standards you walk, walk by are the standards you accept. Your behaviours matter. 
If you walk by a physician being disrespectful to a nurse, that's the standard you accept. This came out of the forum I was at on behalf of Helen, which was with a bunch of CEOs from around the European health system, and they were talking about this idea about the importance of leadership and, and, and the behaviours that you demonstrate as a leader. So I thought that was really powerful. Um, the second gem is the IKEA way, and I touched on this already about um, people equal potential minus disturbance. And this is Anders Ledhagen, and he is international marketing manager for IKEA. And I'm just going to touch on some of the sound bites of things that he said in this hour that we had with him. And this is why we need to have IKEA in New Zealand, by the way. Um, but anyway, not quite yet. Um, but the vision of Ingvar Kamprad, which is the, um, he's the um, founder of IKEA, has stayed the same for many years. And it's, we believe in people, everyone is a talent. Um, and in IKEA, they believe by leadership, by example, the constant desire for renewal, togetherness, and enthusiasm, striving to meet reality, humbleness and willpower, simplicity, and constantly being on the way. They believe in democratic design. They believe in being people and planet positive. Together, they make the most of what they have. They always go through the customer's eyes, and they go to people's homes to understand their problems. And I thought, you know, if you were talking about a health system, that would be a lovely set of principles to live by. And here it's a furniture making company. The, the third gem from Gothenburg is um, population health from the top. Now, you can't see this. It's a picture from me sitting at the back of this forum with 4,000 people in it. But Olivia Wegziel is the Minister of Health for Sweden. So she is the Jonathan uh, equivalent. Um, and on the second slide she put up, she put up the Dahlgren Whitehead rainbow on the social determinants of health. And she started talking about the health system in Sweden, and I was really taken by this. And I acknowledge their tax rates are 53% or higher, but yeah. I think um, <laughs> there's some interesting things in here. So they've got a policy in government around health and all policies, and they've had public health policy in place for many years. Um, and it's established as a national priority for Sweden, and they've legislated for it. Um, they've got a long history of public health. Um, they support kids to swim in school. They put helmets on their kids who ride bikes. They put in safe playgrounds. And again, it's um, related to those wider determinants of health. They put up the obesity statistics, and I have to say I was, I was ashamed to see New Zealand's obesity rates. We were the third worst in the world, according to the stats she put up. Uh, Sweden's rates are very low, and she put the challenge out there and said if Swedish policies were implemented in other countries, this would have a huge cost on the health impact of other countries. So something for us to think about in terms of um, what we're doing in that space. Um, the thing I really loved is she talked about partnerships, and I didn't quite understand how this worked, but uh, the responsibility for health um, is with the state and the individual partnering together. And they talked about uh, a harmony-orientated relationship with a citizen and a contract between the citizen and the state. And I, I struggled to understand how you could kind of legislate for that or how you would translate that through health systems, but I spent a, a, a number of hours talking to the, the stalls that were on the Swedish health system, and I did get this very strong sense of partnering with patients um, and how they do that. And people having, you know, that whole self-management, health literacy thing seemed very, very strong. But again, taxes, remind you, but don't let that put you off. Um, the other thing that they had in Sweden um, were registries. They have over 100 registries which they use to drive quality and consistency of care. So they've developed up national data sets to monitor how they're going as a health system. So um, I guess for, for me, I just wondered if there were some learnings in this around the Swedish health system. We often look to the NHS and we often look to the US. Um, there were some great examples from Sweden and also from Finland in terms of some really innovative health care um, ideas that are coming through those countries. So really taken taken by that and I'm sure if um, Phil Schumack was here he'd be um, also um, you know supporting this idea. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about the fourth gem for me is uh, Gothenburg itself so um, I, paid, I paced the pavement when I got to Gothenburg to explore the city and uh, this city was established in 1625 it's a really old city the downtown area and this is what they've been able to achieve in a city that's um, centuries old. Um, everywhere you went, there were um, plug-in places for your electric cars on the sides of streets. Uh, this was, if you think about Cameron Road, down the middle of Cameron Road, this was the pedestrian walkway, this was the cycle walkway, all with traffic lights, and the cars had single lane either side. 
Uh, Steyr, I can't say that, Steyr and Stahl, um, uh, again, were electric bikes that you could hire for three or four dollars an hour that you could pick up anywhere around the city. Um, you could take from workplace to workplace, they had docking stations around. Uh, fantastic light rail, I know it's expensive, but again, a really great light rail um, network throughout the city. And again, everywhere you went, pedestrian access, cycle access, and in fact, um, cyclists and pedestrians would be very indignant if a car crossed the red light or, or uh, you know, so I've really got a sense around um, just the great emphasis on public transport and also the use of bikes and walking and setting up a city that was very old in a way that's um, having a great influence on health outcomes. And this place gets cold in winter too, by the way. Um, but bikes everywhere. The other really interesting thing was the design of the buildings. Everything was four storey high, but again, going back, so that sort of compact design. But again, I think of Tauranga, I think of Tatumu, um, the conversations we're having with council, why not us? Why can't we do some of this? Um, the little book of big ideas, we were encouraged to write down um, big ideas or things that really ran true with us. And these were a selection of six that I, uh, I took away from the conference. Break the rules, go to the point of care and find the rule that is not for the benefit of the patient. And they talked about using that as a service improvement exercise, working with wards and finding these things that really don't work for patients and how you then address those. Bringing more of yourself to work. Seeing the ageing population as a gift, and this last one, you are the age, you, uh, you are not the age, you're the person. And I think too often we see our old people as a burden, you know, God, they cost us so much money, they're ageing, it's a terrible burden on the health system, we're actually, they're a real asset. Um, there was a theme about creating joy in the workplace, um, which again really ran, ran true with me. And being a good assembler, this idea that we've got to come up with new stuff or new models of care, when actually often someone has invented it before, we might need to change it or modify it, but there's good there's, there's good opportunities and learnings out there. And the example that you talked to was the iPad. The iPad is actually um, an, an assembly of a whole bunch of ideas that was pulled together. So they said. Um, and probably the thing that I liked the most um, came from a coffee shop uh, across the road where I went each day and had a, had a latte. And I, d I mean, it kind of speaks to itself really. <laughs> but um, the thing that, that really struck me travelling um, to Sweden all in one go and getting on planes and going through airports um, is the amount of people that are, are doing this, you know? And we've, there's been a, a huge change in the last couple of years with the use of devices. And at the airport, everywhere I went, we're all kind of attached to our device. Now you can see that as a huge threat or you could see it as a huge opportunity. I think it's a bit of both. But this just rings to me the importance of relationships and uh, the face-to-face -face contact that we need to have and we need to keep, keep in balance. So, um, second to last slide, and then I'm going to finish 15 minutes early, Joe, so I've met my KPIs. I just wanted to acknowledge um, this book, um, Barry Posner, um, and he talks about you can make a difference and you can't do it alone, and there's a great little TED talk if you've got the chance to have a look. It's only 13 minutes long. And I guess for me, this encapsulated some of my own values, uh, and you know, just a couple of the points that he makes when he talks about, you know, of being a follower, the, the first person you have to follow is actually yourself. The first person that's going to have um, doubt about what you're doing is actually you. I was telling myself before the presentation, oh my god, it's going to go right, it's going to be rubbish. You know, but you're the first person to judge yourself often and you've got to, you've got to acknowledge that and deal with that. You can make a difference and he talks, talks about it being easier when you know who you are, knowing what your values are and what's important to you. And I think, again, that's another, another truth for me. And leadership is a relationship between those who lead and those who follow, and it's the quality of the relationship that's key. So anyway, just some of the um, uh, sound bites from me. This is a good read. There's tons of leadership books out there. This is just one that's worked for me and why, why I titled this session, You Can Make a Difference and You Can't Do It Alone.